Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Carmen. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to see you all here. Some of you know, some of you uh, maybe I'll get to know someday. Talk loud. <coughs> I, yeah, I started photographing the towers in 1970, and that's, I had an attitude in 1970. I was not 30, I was 25 then. And uh, uh, I uh, looked, the towers became a symbol to me, kind of symbol that Carol was speaking about, uh, and of, uh, you know, power, but also of lack of care for the problems and the needs that the city had at that time, which not only uh, uh, didn't get any better in the following years, you know, it didn't start, things didn't start getting better in New York until about 1990. So uh, that was one of my, <laughs> my first pictures. The guy woke up and saw me taking his picture, and he said, buy me a sandwich. <laughs> so I bought him a sandwich and, and uh, ham and cheese. That sort of point to the guy because I didn't see anybody. But now I see a person there. Right? Yeah. There, there he is. I'm sorry. Oh. Okay. So uh, I was going to the Bronx. I mean, my mission at that time was sort of to record everything that was wrong with New York. Because I figured that was going to make me feel good in some way. So in the Bronx, in addition, you know, it just it looked like all of this stuff was sort of rusting in some way. And, uh, and back in the distance, you could see the skyline. Of course, that's the Empire State Building. And here are the Twin Towers you barely can see them. <laughs> I had a great surprise the other day. They put a big wall on the street where I took this picture called Longwood Avenue in the Bronx. And, uh, and this is the big railroad yard. They got big railroad yards in the South Bronx. So uh, I actually had to climb up and take this picture. So that's what the, this is with a different lens. Uh, the first lens was a 200 millimeter lens. This is like a 100 millimeter lens. But what it, what it really blew me off with this picture was to see the size of that, that sliver building. And I expected something else to dominate the landscape. And here was this sliver. I couldn't take my eyes off it. Uh, and uh, of course, New York had changed. Some of the buildings that you see in the picture before had disappeared. And it didn't look so rusted. But uh, uh, there it is. I went, I used to be delighted walking along Jersey City. And, uh, and there, were, there, were, there were really places of wonder there. There was a cemetery of ferry boats. I don't know who remembers that. Uh, you know, with the old ferry, there were lots of ferry boats, and there were dogs that lived in those ferry boats, and there were hippies and rats. <laughs> rats, I'm sure. <laughs> and I just, uh, I, I, you know, so, the, so here is one of the piers, and through the piers you could see the buildings and the construction. So what I have tried to do for today is to have views uh, I've tried to organize these things, which kind of started randomly, and then I started putting some sense of rationality into the randomness. And the sense of rationality was to go back to the same places, or to the same places that were maybe not exactly there, but really near, or uh, try to use the same lenses if I could, but sometimes I would use 35, sometimes at 28. But basically, uh, you, 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 the lenses capture the same scene. So I took that scene and then I photographed it over time. And this is 1970. That's about 77. And you can still see it's left over of the piers. 
And, and this is the same year, and what you could see was this attraction that the skyline had. So what at the beginning to me was a place where, <laughs> where I would picture a doorman that says you get no business coming into this building, you know, beautiful bar up on the top or beautiful something or other. There were some buildings, of course, I could go to, like, the, like of course, the World Trade Center, but many of the other ones I couldn't get past the doorman. But then the skyline was a completely different thing. The skyline was dem democratic. This, it was open to everybody and enjoyed by everybody. I mean, these folks were fishing there, drinking Miller beer and enjoying the skyline. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> also, I used to take a lot, a lot of gypsy cabs. And I, for some crazy reason, I started collecting the gypsy cab cards that they give you with the phone numbers. And a lot of them had the skyline. So one day, if you want to make an exhibit the size of your poster, <laughs> you can put this different views of the skyline. I don't, haven't collected the recent ones and see if the World Trade Center has been replaced by the by World Trade Center one. So here you have a Fourth of July celebration in 1978, I think. And there again, one time, I don't know why, I went to Statue of Liberty State Park and made that picture with the full moon. I guess I had a car or something. And, uh, and uh, I mess if I had tried one then, because otherwise it would have been a lot more cool. Uh, and this was in uh, September 11th, September 12th. September 12th, and it sort of captured a little bit like the randomness that was going on in that place. It's like nobody knew where they were going. It's like rationality has sort of left us, and it was like those, there was like a war of tugboats going on there. And you can still see the smoke coming out. Uh, that's much more recent. This is taking 2016, and you see the World Trade Center one is almost completed, and that's the 4th of July in 2016. And that's the most recent one about two months ago. So what do you see? You see basically is that the old sky, uh, skyline that I started with has been basically replaced, about 80% of it replaced. And it's not outside of the trade center buildings that have gone. Most of the other buildings are still there, but they're behind. So you can, you can see some of the old skyline. This was some of the tallest buildings then. Uh, now, as Carol said, you know, they've been replaced by much taller ones. And also the materials of the newer buildings are different. So you see that, uh, you see that combination of older buildings uh, that are barely there, uh, or very, very barely visible, and the sort of new glassy towers that are sort of dominating the skyline. The, this is a view, I kind of laugh because it, it's like a picture that everybody wanted to take this picture. Why? Because it has everything. It has the, the Brooklyn Bridge, it has the Statue of Liberty, which you're going to see over here somewhere. And then it had the lower Manhattan skyline, of course, with the towers. And that's September 11th that I was there. And, and, uh, and here, here you begin, you can see the Statue of Liberty. And this was like a few months after September 11th. I just wanted to see how the new skyline was going to, to uh, the form that it would take. And it was surprised to see how long it took to to sort of begin to see this changing. Uh, this was uh, 2002, I believe, and this is much much later. This 
Where is that? Where is this? To take this? I'm sorry, what? Where are you when you're taking this? Well, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's called the Manhattan Bridge. Oh, hold on. And so, <laughs> so, 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 it's so, I mean, every tourist, I mean, if you see them passing by on the Manhattan Bridge, will stop at the same spot where I stay and take the same picture. There is also, I'm sure I'm over your postcards, you have not one, but several, taken from the same point of view. Uh, to, on my defense, I should say, I took the picture at all times. So I would take it at 3 in the morning, I would take it at 5 in the morning, I would take it at uh, uh, sunset. Uh, and that, of course, is the, this is 2010, uh, 2011, 10. And this is just, I just took this, this photograph. And here you can see that it's, you know, you have the projects that were there before. You have some, these are some of the few older buildings that can still be seen. But basically, I mean, the Woolworth building is invisible. I think you can see just a sliver of it there. And, uh, and that's just you know, something I just took. Again, <clears throat> and thanks to someone that, that uh, uh, some of us folks here know, uh, Peter Marcuse had contacts with the housing authority. And I could, uh, I got permission through their <coughs> PR department to go to the roof of the projects. So that got me like to the 14th story or the 18th story. And whenever you look from that point of view, you could see the skyline, but you could, but you saw other things, but you, the skyline was there, so you would take a picture of the skyline. So this is taken from a place called Ocean Hill, which is where Brownsville, East New York, and uh, Bedside, and they all sort of come together. And there was some, some stories about going up there. Uh, I think when I took this picture, there was a woman on the landing of the roof landing. Uh, a pregnant woman was actually doing drugs there. You know, just walked by and took this picture and then went back. But the, the thing too is that this, uh, this allowed me to see the skyline in relationship to the city. And of course, this is the only case where you can see it very well, but I have many other ones where, you, where, where, where the, I did the same thing. This is the uh, 70s? What? The date of this the, one? The, the date is 89, 1989. And uh, what you're going to see here is the appearance over here. There'll be the new Hudson Yards that will come near the end. That's the Empire State Building here. This is the Williamsburg uh, Savings Bank building. Uh, again, uh, as we see it, the garbage continues to accumulate here. <laughs> the empty lots are here. Uh, some of this area has been sort of almost designated uh, to house the homeless and to uh, put uh, treatment places, you know, for drug addiction. I remember talking to Mark here that, uh, you know, and we used to, he used to tell me, go to Palmetto Street, which is probably over here somewhere, you know, and it was like the night of the living dead. Uh, but this was, you know, it's, it's like in New York that I guess fortunately is not less anymore. Uh, again, here you begin to see how the box stores are coming into those empty lots. You see them here? You see, it's still uh, trashy there. And, uh, and here, you still have the, the World Trade Center, so this is probably 98, 99. And, and well, we're still, this is about the same time. And here we have the new, the World Trade Center one, and this, it's been almost all built up, 
And I thought what was interesting here, you could see it better, is that somebody painted the skyline of New York here. <laughs> so that's a very, that's a more recent picture. And you still don't see the Hudson Yards coming up that they came up here. Uh, I think this was taken uh, uh, about two years ago, this is last year. And here you can see the skyline. Uh, and you can see how this, this empty lot is sort of dealt with. And you can see all those buildings that have sort of uh, redone roofs. Uh, so, so if you go back to the first picture, you will see that that's, that was not the case back then. And that's, and I just took this picture. And, uh, <laughs> and right after I take this picture, I look back, and I see about 15 teenagers coming there. And I said, I'm tired, I'm done. They're going to push me off, and that's it. And they're <laughs> You know, you know, they wanted to do a rap video. <laughs> they didn't pay any attention to me. <laughs> and, uh, and so they, the only thing they said, isn't the skyline nice? Mm -hmm. So here we see the view from Madison Street, again from the, uh, from the Manhattan Bridge. And the first picture was taken in 1977. Again, I had some, uh, uh, really took some risks there, so I was actually signing level where the train goes by. So I was right by the train tracks when I took this picture, so you can see the differences that the, the pictures afterwards. The next one is from the same level, but then afterwards is from below a little bit farther below because, uh, you know, of course that's not open up. So here, that's September 11th, so everybody gets to pass, walk out of Manhattan through, through the bridges, and the Manhattan Bridge is one of them, and, uh, and they get to see, uh, well, of course they see this, and, uh, and, uh, uh, I think the thing that amazed me was to look down the street and it looked like everybody was conducting business, you know, like business as usual in Chinatown. So that's more recent. Uh, here you can see, I think this is Gary's building. Uh, and this is of course the, the World Trade Center 1 being completed. Again, this are taking a little bit lower than the first pictures, and that's like from last week or a couple of weeks ago. So this is a view from the north. I really have views from the looking west, looking south, uh, looking north, and uh, and uh, and looking from Jersey, which is uh, and looking from Brooklyn, which is getting mixed up. But in any case, all four cardinal points were more or less taken care of. So this is going from the south, going north. And that's my son when he was four years old. And, uh, and here, it's right before a storm. So uh, that's the reason the, 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 the sky is a little hazy. Uh, this is again another another one of those things where you would uh, be riding the Staten Island Ferry. People would just go in and and, uh, and just uh, look so, some sort of spellbound that uh, uh, they approach in, as they approach the skyline, as they approach Lower Manhattan. Uh, here again, I think it's one of the last of the pictures with the Trade Center. Uh, no, that's the last one. And here is without it. So you, you, it, it really, I guess with that, the, you know, you see the tremendous difference that it made. I mean, how, the, uh, how a shape that had this, uh, somehow from a distance uh, become very appealing. Uh, 
was destroyed. And then you have the new building, of course, Wall Trade Center 1, uh, pushing up. I have many more photographs here, but I edited them you know, because of the time. Uh, here is completed, and, and it is a more recent, a more recent picture, and that's, uh, that's the view at night. And here what you see is, uh, is this extension to the, uh, to the right. I still don't know what the name of that building is. Manhattan but it's Square. Manhattan, Manhattan Square. 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 Manhattan Square. It's awfully big. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's going to be two blocks up, one even tall. The community's up and on. How many stories? Eight, it's like it's 90 about, stories. It's about 80, 80 stories. Yeah, yeah. And it sticks out, you can see it all over Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah. And here's my last picture. I mean, I didn't want to show it to you because a little bit cheesy. But, <laughs> but then again, you know, I got up at 3 in the morning to take it. So I figured. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, I wanted to end up with, uh, I guess, what Carol had said, you know, how he makes family and. And, and the buildings and the city, I mean, it's a way in which, in which at, cer at a certain point, you know, I would take my kids and I took my daughter and my son. And this, this was in 85. And in 1982, in 19, 1982, an artist called Agnes... Uh, Dennis. Van? Dennis. Agnes Dennis. Okay, Dennis uh, had planted corn in what she, what she called the most expensive piece of real estate in the world. So, it, it was right here. It was, uh, it was actually there. on the site, yes. <laughs> then you should have a copy of that. So three years later, you know, that, that uh, wheat was so powerful that it continued to grow. And we went there because there was an art exhibit and there were pictures of Ronald Reagan there. And uh, my son kind of started walking and got lost there. My daughter here was eating bananas. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I sort of wanted to end with this picture because I just thought, and, and she was, uh, her, her idea with the wheat there was somehow that, that she wanted to sort of change the world with it. And I, I wrote it down somewhere. Uh, she says, what pyramids all convey is the human drama, our hopes and dreams against great odds. And uh, he, she wanted to do an intrusion of the country into the metropolis and trying to make the world receive their priorities. And actually, I thought of that and I said, well, should I have any goals for them? <laughs> you, know, you know, but it's kind of the lazy way to sort of just do your stuff and see if you are, get to a point, which is last week. And you say, I'm telling you the story until the last, um, up to the last week. But, you know, what I can think of what my, should I have priorities? Should I have, should I, should I have uh, goals? Should I have, uh, or should I just show? Uh, so, any case, I'd like to end with that. <laughs> not doing a very good job in actually introducing you, but just introducing the themes that, um, so Camille has, has many books, and I forgot to hold up this one, which is no longer in print, but, I, but I, we hope that something like it will come back to um, the Twin Towers Remembered, which is uh, a, a small book that you did a few years ago. Um, so that's why it's uh, sold out, even when I just find it on you know, eBay or, or recycled at its ones. But this is, you can take a look at this one later. Um, and it is, uh, and uh, the but the photographs that you see in here, I think, can mostly be 
downloaded on the Library of Congress's site, right? Yes. Because you donated these these photographs no, as well. Paid. They paid you <laughs> for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've known him for a very long time, and actually, you have Ken Jackson in common because Ken Jackson wrote the introduction to this this book, right? Short short introduction. And Ken is a good friend of Camila's and mine, and he sends his um, uh, regards tonight, but he had a date with his granddaughter that he couldn't break, otherwise he would be here tonight. So, and Ken had wrote the introduction to a number of Camilo's uh, projects, and when I think for your first publication, Silent Cities, about cemeteries, you, you did as a collaboration with Ken. So, so I've known Camilo for a long time, and um, I neglected to to mention his, his, you know, his revolutionary past. I think he gave you, you know, a little bit of a, a taste of, of that. So the, um, the, the social impulse that he's musing about right now is always the drive that brought him to all, all these sites in order to um, go to the housing projects and keep them in the foreground and keep repeating <coughs> visits there. Uh, but that collection, that really valuable archive of documenting um, American cities from the 70, now 40 years and, um, forward, uh, is in the collection of the Library of Congress or at the Getty Museum. So um, his, his, uh, his, his work and his, the documentation is something that's, that will serve you know, scholars um, for, for many years hence. So I forgot to put his work in that context before. Um, and in this beauty uh, um, of a, a, a little handbook, so kind of equal equal size, um, Richard captures New York for us. So now we're going to give him the chance to talk about that. So, so there he goes to OK, so um, I'm an architect. I don't do that anymore. But I started doing that in the 74. I did it for approximately 10 years. Um, due to a series of unexpected events, I wound up switching to photography. And um, being an architect, I had an interest in buildings. It, it, photography was always a hobby up until that point. And um, I decided to try to start making a living at it. Uh, so because I was interested in, in shooting buildings, and I was in New York, and I was interested in the skyline, um, I wound up in working with ad agencies where they needed photographs of buildings, eventually winding up doing a lot of work in the real estate industry um, up until this day. And uh, it's great because I get access to places that other people can't get access to, and um, there are constantly new perches in the sky that I get to shoot from, and so there's a view that's never existed before. And that's always really exciting to me, especially when it's a good one like this. Um, so this was taken from what Camilla referred to as the sliver building that a lot of people don't, don't like, <laughs> 432 Park Avenue. I show this picture to people, and they assume I'm in a plane. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, it does, it, the building does have great views in, in all directions. Um, and I actually, uh, I worked on that project for five years, documenting the construction of the building from the foundation to the top. This is uh, a shot from Jersey. I just thought I'd give Midtown Skyline a little love because it's all about downtown. So this is right on the axis of 42nd Street. And, um, and let me just add that in that case over there, so to make the historical graph of book bookends, Andreas Feininger's photograph, pretty much the same place on axis with 42nd Street, um, is from the 1940s, one of the greatest views of, of New York ever in, in black and white. So you had, you had color to find it. And this is, is just from, it's near uh, Hamilton Park, and it's easy to access as opposed to a lot of other places. Um, and that's 432 on the left side. So here we are. This, um, I actually thought this was done right before 9-11, but it turns out, in looking back, that it was in 1999. It was, uh, in certain respects, one of the most dangerous photos I ever took because I was out on a pier which was falling down, which no longer exists at all. I was trespassing, which I tend to do a lot of. And um, I was out on the pier, and I got attacked by geese. <laughs> <laughs> I must have been near a nest or something. What, one goose, in particular, didn't, didn't like me. And um, 
So I sort of fought it off with my tripod, actually. And, and then I just, I hunkered down. I sort of stayed low. I kept the tripod low. And uh, he sent out a distress, or she sent out a distress call. And this huge flock of geese came. And it landed right on the pier between where I was and where I had to leave. So I was a little concerned about this. Um, and I thought I was actually might have to call the police to like airlift me out or something. Uh, but I took um, the picture. It was a picture done before this, which I don't think is here, which was the daytime view, which was actually used by the New York Times the first weekend after 9-11 as the before shot. Uh, so anyway, it was a great location. It does not exist anymore. How did you get out, may I ask? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So to finish the story, <laughs> so right after I took that photo, right when I was about to leave, they all decided to fly away. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. <laughs> um, Did you get a picture? Uh, no, no pictures, no. I don't do geese. <laughs> so, uh, I don't do people or geese. <laughs> so, um, here we are. I, uh, I believe this is at an elevated position. Again, because I work in the real estate industry a lot, I get access to places. I'm also, um, before 9 11, I just used to go into buildings and go up on the roofs, and it wasn't very hard. I, I initially started by trying to get permission, and that didn't work really well, so I just started going, and that was fine. After um, 2001, everything changed in terms of security, and it became much more difficult to, to do it um, without getting permission. But this is from Jersey City. Um, there's a place in Liberty State Park that I always used to go to shoot, and there was one spot where Lilworth was right between the towers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I love that spot just because you had that. And then one day, I don't know what year, uh, a very tall <coughs> residential building went up and blocked Lilworth, and this didn't exist anymore. And this obviously after 9-11. It took me a while. I didn't, don't think I went out to shoot for about a month. Uh, and actually, the first shot I did, which I think is in my book, but it's not here, was a dusk shot. And it was really eerie, because you could see the glow of the construction lights from the site. Um, you know, this may have been the next day. And here from Brooklyn, again, the towers are not there. So now we've got the new One World Trade. I was the, actually the designated photographer for One World Trade. I was hired to, um, to try to find locations to photograph the building when it was about two-thirds up. And uh, so I found locations in, in Brooklyn and within Manhattan and, and in Jersey that I was able to get up on tops of buildings. And, uh, what they did with those photos was they CGI'd in the top of the building for their brochures, their advertising, or whatever they needed. This is, this is legitimate, though. This is real. This, I think, was one of the photos that the, uh, the top was CGI'd in. The original photo, the top third of the building is not there. And this was very recent. I did this basically for the museum for this show. They needed something really recent. I, I had not photographed because to World Trade, which is there, um, was on the construction. I don't like to shoot when things are under construction because I tend to want things to look really finished and clean. So I was sort of waiting, and um, and this was done, I guess, a couple of months ago.
This was, unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't go with the intention of shooting the rainbow, and I was a little bit late. I think it might have been better if I was a little bit earlier, but luckily I didn't miss it completely. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just get lucky with whatever's going by. Usually it's a, a garbage barge, <laughs> <laughs> which I, I wait for those to go by. <laughs> And this is actually from very close to the location that the 42nd Street photo was done from. Again, Hamilton Park in, in Jersey. As I'm saying that, I realize I don't tell my locations, and I just tell all of you, so <laughs> don't tell anybody else, especially photographers. This is from. Um, the very tall Jehovah's Witness oh, building yeah. Mm -hmm. in Brooklyn, um, where I have access and where three years ago I got frostbite, <laughs> which took all well, five minutes one morning. Wow. And this is from the George Washington Bridge, where they've now put up netting, I assume to prevent people from jumping. So this, uh, I have to be shooting from the netting now, but when I did this, and shooting from bridges is difficult because uh, they shake and it's hard. Um, kind of have to time, time the cars going by. One in Manhattan Square, which is the building that was sort of the eyesore in that last picture. I'm also the photographer for that one, um, is just to the right here, I cut it off. I was actually, I was actually shooting for them when I did this shoot, but uh, I wanted this for myself. And this is a sequence, they not, I don't think they were all the same day, but So sometime early on in my career, I decided, uh, because I was doing Skyline, they lended themselves to panoramic. I went out and I bought myself a panoramic camera. And um, I didn't switch, actually, to digital until about six years ago. I was sort of the last kid on the block. I was a real film guy, and I you know, just fought it till the end, and I kept telling my clients the film was better. I still like the quality of film, but um, uh, I did a lot of work with the panoramic camera, which was a, lot, a medium format camera, and um, th this is not with that. Some of the long pictures that you saw were. Um, and I hadn't used it in a long time. I actually got an assignment with it about a year ago. So I had been thinking about getting rid of it, so I was glad I hadn't. <coughs> It's, it's a format that we obviously used in the exhibition, so um, that this whole north wall is from 1876 forward through the 1930s with panoramic views. Um, most from about 1900 to the 30s from Irving Underhill, who was one of the leading commercial photographers of the day and did lots of books and postcards. But these really extraordinary panoramic views, which are also on the Library of Congress, so anybody can access them, although go to our website where you can see them enlarged and really focus in on, on the extraordinary detail. Um, is, that, is that detail there in all of your photographs? Because you know, I'm most, well, that's Richard, that there, so there's certainly a lot of detail. Right, so that was that done distance. with the panoramic camera. That was, again, 1999. Um, and you know, the detail is fabulous. I mean, better, you know, it's somewhat better than you would have gotten initially with digital cameras. Now the digital cameras are kind of caught up, and I'm, I shoot now with a digital camera, and uh, I, I don't know how I would do what I do now without it. <laughs> Just looking at some of the jobs that I have and how, much, how many photographs I have to take, and it's, 
would just be a nightmare for this film. Uh, yes. Richard, this picture, where was it taken from? I'm not telling you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> The W. So, so you know, how about you stand up now? Here, let, let me go back to the panoramic view. And, um, and, and uh, any, anyone who asks questions not about where, we, where you were standing, <laughs> uh, but any, anything else, um, please raise your hand. How did they do the panoramic from the 1800s? Uh, so the Beale, 1876, and that's the Bourne's New York Public Library, um, it, th those are only three of the panels of a five-panel panorama, which were all, um, I think they were 11 by 13 glass plate negatives, aluminum prints. Uh, and so <laughs> Joshua Beale schlepped his, uh, all of his equipment up the uh, finished tower, but the unfinished bridge of the Brooklyn Tower, and. 300 or 400 feet in the air because you can see in that photograph that you're on eye level with the top of the tower of the Manhattan one. So you're and you're looking down on the city. So we carried all that equipment um, up up the tower and you know exposed his the, the lens for long exposures. And it, you can see the detail in that, which is much larger than the prints that would have been made at the time in the 1870s. He sold it. He sold the whole thing. From, and apparently didn't sell very many, but we found in our research for $25 you could buy the entire panorama, and we only know of four in the world. Uh, and they're all, they're all in collections. A um, couple of CCA in, in Canada, and NYPL has one. Uh, and they're only about 11 inches high, and so long that, you, that they don't they, they can't really exhibit them that easily because they're nine feet long and 11 inches high. Wow. So that's much greater detail um, from the scan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a question for each of you. Richard, I'm curious, when I look at your rivers and the bay, somehow they seem much bluer than when I look at them. <laughs> I, it's all real. <laughs> so I can understand when you're shooting at sunset from Jersey that the water may be bluer, but no filters, no? No. I mean, I really, you know, I, I run things through Photoshop, but I really try generally to maintain what it really looked like. I don't play around much. So, you know, a, a little cleaning up things. But in terms of color, I never change the color. And uh, Camilo, I'm curious, on 9-11, what you, what your itinerary, as it were, was as the day developed, what you chose to do? Well, I just wanted to go to the very place. And uh, on the way there, there were all these guards that, uh, that worked for the courthouses. And they had their guns, you know, they yeah. just, just their hands on their guns. And they say, you can't go there. You can't go through. You can't go farther down. And, and otherwise, I'll break your camera. <laughs> and uh, so then I sort of try to make a round. I mean, I should have gone around uh, to the Woodside Highway, to the, the, FDR, the FDR, and you know, then I could have gotten much closer. But uh, you know, I made my way to the Manhattan Bridge, and it was like exile from the city. You know, just that sort of leaving the promised land, and, and it's just everybody was just walking there and the cops were guiding you. At the other end of the bridge, the Manhattan Bridge, there was a young cop, I was about half my age at the time, and he looked at me and, and he says, I have to look in your camera bag. <laughs> you know, but it was painful for him and it was painful for me. And then you know, I had to stay in Brooklyn because you couldn't go back the same day. I, re I read a couple of weeks ago that Kodachrome might be coming back, <laughs> and if so, would that be something that you would use again along with digital, or you would just say that this is not interesting to me anymore? Or not in terms of 35 millimeter now, I think I'm probably pretty locked into. Digital. In terms of the panoramic camera, if I had opportunities to use that again, um, I might. I mean, I always I used Kodachrome 25, 
when I started. And we did, well, when I first started, when I was an architect and I was doing this as a hobby, I only shot black and white. Um, so when I switched to commercial, it was actually difficult sort of to make the transition to see things in color because I saw everything in black and white. Now it's kind of like if I need to shoot black and white, it's, it's a different mindset. But um, I only used Kodachrome 25 and then something happened that the color went bad and I had to switch to Kodachrome 64 and then Fuji started coming out with film and um, ultimately I switched to Fuji and, and now if I do use the panoramic camera in, you know, in recent years, I've used Fuji. So uh, if I had occasion to use it and it was out, I'd give it a try. So my, my question, based on what you just said about seeing things in black and white or in color, um, can you talk a little bit about how you see color or, how, or light or, you know, seeing in black and white to me means, for, as an architect, see, seeing forms, right? So, so light and shadow. And color is a very different way to, to see the city than as, you know, as uh, lit forms. Well, when I was doing black and white, I just, I, I just did black and white. I didn't really think about about color, and I didn't really think you know this should really be in color. Um, so I think, and again, maybe as an architect, I was looking at things more in terms of form and texture and lights and darks, uh, more than thinking about you know what the colors were doing. And when I started doing it commercially, and, and there was no need for black. Once in a while, I get a black and white facade, but with the documentation of the construction of 432, they actually wanted black and white. But because it was digital, I mean, I shot in color and converted it. But I still, in my head, was thinking more, I trying to think more in terms of uh, form and contrast and um, as opposed to the colors, because I knew it was going to be converted, I was going to convert it to black and white. Uh, so, it's a little hard to explain. It's like when you use a view camera and you look through and it's upside down. And I used the view camera for a very short period of time. And you know, initially when I started doing it, I was like this all the time <laughs> because I, you know, I. But then at some point it switches. All of a sudden, you, you know, even though you're looking at it upside down, you're seeing it right side up. It's odd. Uh, your brain just sort of does something. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's sort of similar in black and white versus color, I think. Not similar in that way, but in terms of the way I think about it. But you, you're, the color that you, of the photographs that you choose for your books is so vibrant, you know, so, so lush, so exceptional, right? Well, generally, you know, I try to take, you know, when I'm shooting for my books and when I'm shooting for my real estate clients, I'm trying to take pretty pictures. Uh, you know, every once in a while there's something atmospheric going on and, you know, I, I like it, and then, but the client doesn't like it. That's not what they want to see. That's not what they're using to sell. Uh, so, yeah, I'm very aware of, of the color now and um, the clarity of it. And uh, I still, every once in a while I've got a color shot. I, I look at it in black and white, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I'm not sure that answers the question. Question? Mm -hmm. No. Other How questions? You, yes. No, go ahead. How do you navigate entering familiar neighborhoods to you because you visit them often, but the people in those areas may not be uh, may not know you? How do you kind of navigate that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do I navigate the streets? And yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I mean, like, the same way I do here. I mean, it's just, uh, I, I just, uh, I'm used to, I guess, you know. I've done it so often that, that it doesn't bother me. I mean, sometimes I look uh, behind and see what's going on if the, if the spot looks a little bit uh, dangerous or something, or seems dangerous. So. Uh, I mean, I, I think I have a pretty good sense, except when I'm surprised. You know, and sometimes, you know, you're surprised, like, uh, you're up on the roof of a project, and then you get the cops. And the cops, you know, if they see you there, they come up with their guns out. 
I mean, they're not pointing at you, but they're, you know, they have them, and, and, uh, and then you have to do some talking. <laughs> you know, and they get you out. But basically, I mean, it's just, uh, it, it's, it, it's, uh, it's getting a lot easier, too. I mean, New York is a lot safer now than it used to be. I mean, back in the 70s and 80s, it was, it was, you were taking your life in your hands, and you know, oftentimes you go to the neighborhood. So, uh, now it's much better. I had, a, I had a situation where I was, I think I was photographing a CBS building from the other side of 6th Avenue from the top of the hill or something. And, um, I had permission to be up there, but uh, somebody saw me up on the roof, and I guess I was sort of hanging over the ledge that I sometimes tend to do, and <laughs> thought, and thought <laughs> that I was a jumper and called the police. And so there was this huge scene on the roof with like a million cops of security you know, running, running out on the roof to you know prevent me from jumping. So I've had I've gotten locked out on roofs a few times, which. Is, not fun and problematic. <laughs> you know, I'm not supposed to be there. The door closes behind me, and I usually try to make sure the door is not going to close. But you know, sometimes some security guys going around and sees the door open, it pulls it closed. So uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. I've had a few situations where I was worried about the people around, and um, I've been lucky. Except on Waterfell. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so I've been lucky with that. I, sometimes I just I see a situation, even though I want the picture, I just choose to avoid it. Because you've got expensive equipment, you know. Um, and it's actually more worried about my life, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it is actually amazing to me. I've never had anything stolen because I've been in situations where it would have been very easy for somebody to grab my stuff and go. Um, I actually wouldn't want to live. I'd want to live probably around. 70, because I feel like it's it's almost, you're too far removed yeah. from the city. It's like you're too far above it. You don't feel like you're not part of it anymore. Mm -hmm. Down at 70, it's, you know. <laughs> how many floors is it again? 432? Well, depending on how you're counting. Oh, it's, you know, it's 90 something, oh. but it's hot. There are floors of 14. Above. So, so it's pretty, you know, it's taller than World Trade, 432. Mm -hmm. uh, one question about that building, 432. There's uh, like um, uh, spaces right. that are they for uh, social functions? No. no. <laughs> there, when, when the building was originally designed, the first model wasn't there. But in the engineering the building, they realized they needed to have spaces to allow the wind to blow through. Otherwise, it was going to be a problem. So there, the, 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 they lost a lot of you know, potential apartments there because, you know, they're two floors high. But there's nothing that, that goes on there. You know, on the bottom of the building is yes. in the third, third right. place right there. You can take a close look at it. So there are, you know, five levels of those. Oh, wow. So, so, I if both of you can speak to your, how your relationship with the city has changed following the events of 9-11. Uh, oh, how the photographers, how has it, like, how's it changed photographing the city? Well, it just as with Camilo, I go back, you know, many times to the same spot, and I find a spot that you know I really like, and I'd say, you know, I still go back to the same spots that were uh, post 9/11. It's pre 9/11, um, and it is, you know, you just see, these, you know, huge changes taking place. You know, buildings like the classical buildings, unfortunately, disappearing. You know, in, in the new canyons that are being created by the, the tall, the new tall ones. Uh, certainly, you know, again, you know, Camilo was out there right away. You know, the day of, the day after, and I somehow had trouble bringing myself to, to get out there again. Um, so we need to close in a second. We'll have a reception, so you can take a look at the books. So you can talk individually um, to Camilla or Richard and have have a, have a drink and look around. Um, but let me throw you either a hardball or softball to, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as a conclusion. So Camilla, you talked at the beginning how you were you were angry at the world or ang angry at the, the situation 
in New York in, in, in the 70s. Um, can you both just say how you feel about New York? Um, Do they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I, my kids were born here. You know, I, I, I've lived most of my life here. I, I go back to Chile where I was born and people ask me where you're from. <laughs> And uh, uh, if I'm away from New York, I, I miss the city. And uh, uh, you know, even if they treat me well, I mean, even if I'm happy in the other place, uh, you know, I have a sense of neighborhood where I live. I, people know me, I mean, some of the storekeepers and stuff. And uh, it, it's just, it's, it's my place is where to live. <laughs> how, how do I feel? I mean, it, 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 certainly the, the situation of the city has improved tremendously. But here is a mystery that I sort of run into recently. Is that uh, I did a lot of photography of crossroads, which are places where a lot of transportation systems come together particularly those crossroads that are mostly minority and there are six or seven around, there's one in north. And although what I was seeing in the Bronx, like on the Harvard from Bronx to 149th and 3rd, or Southern Boulevard and Westchester Avenue, or, uh, uh, you know, a uh, couple of them in Brooklyn, uh, what, uh, what I saw, is look a lot better than that Bronx of the 70s and the 80s. But then I would look at the numbers and the poverty levels of the people were very similar. So people here uh, today, you know, in some of those neighborhoods, if you look at the, at the statistics around for the zip code or the uh, census tract, you know, this is often it's close to 40% poverty level, uh, yet everything looks a lot better. You know, so the poverty continues. So, Richard, is it a romance with New York? Or? Yeah, I love New York. <laughs> I mean, and I, it's the only place I've ever lived. I was uh, brought up in Queens when I was 17. Um, I started at Columbia, I was there for seven years, but you know, from 17 on, I've been in Manhattan, and I, uh, you know, it's where my work is, it's where my, my art is, I can't imagine living anywhere else. And um, it's, you know, some of the changes are, are for the good, and some not so much. I mean, I sort of uh, hate to see some of the great old buildings disappear. Luckily, we're a little more protected than we, we used to be. I lament the fact that um, I never got to photograph the old Penn Station. So uh, there are, are those things, and then you know a lot of the architecture that's going up is not great, but there are are some good ones. So um, I prefer when I'm working on the good ones. <laughs> great. Well, thank you both so much. since uh, 2004 in the space, almost 20 years since I started the museum. And uh, 2004, and we're talking about Richard and Neil and I, have known Neil for probably the longest time, Richard, for uh, you know, going on 15 years or 20 years or something like that since, uh, um, uh, since I've known his work and, and then um, in uh, kind of you know, paying attention and incorporating uh, his uh, his ideas and his work and enlisting him and Camilo too in, in our projects. Uh, so long time and years passed. So 2004 we moved into this space and we were held up of course by the cataclysmic events of 9/11 um, that uh, are you know that we're remembering now 17 years ago tonight and when you walk out of the museum onto West Street and the kind of Esplanade 
you'll see just two blocks from here the Tribune and Lights. And so tonight, if the cloud cover isn't so so low, you'll be you know kind of beneath the this incredibly potent and almost universal symbol because you see it in the whole from the whole metropolitan region. But this is the place, right? Downtown is the place, uh, and we were held up, and the, this, this this building had just been completed in 2001 and enclosed. Uh, the hotel wasn't open yet. The condos weren't sold. Uh, but the project was held up as Battery Park City became a quarantine zone um, because of the, uh, the, the pollution and the, um, the recovery efforts from the fall of the towers. So tonight we remember the towers. We remember, we, I think, uh, celebrate the resilience of New York, uh, just as it's, you know, it's hard even to talk about, it, isn't it, when you think back. Um, of those, um, of those uh, events of this particular day, it's hard not to personalize it. But tonight it is, a, is both um, a, an, an overview and a reflection, and it's also uh, an autobiography of these two photographers, really extraordinary photographers, who take a very different approach to documenting the skyline. And um, because this exhibition called Skyline tries to encompass from the very first tall buildings, tall commercial buildings in 1874 in, in New York to the present day in a sequence that watches the dynamic of the city unfold, you know, growing ever taller, the taller building replaces a smaller one, um, but then things happen in the skyline. It was impossible to think about the idea of an exhibition about skyline without thinking about the absence of the towers. And the model that we have right there is from the engineering department of the Port Authority. It's something we've had in the in the museum um, since 9-11, and we had, we had their celebratory model in the very first uh, location the museum we went back on Wall Street when we started in our first show. So we always paid attention to the Twin Towers because they were um, not just the tallest buildings in the world for the brief time in, uh, from 1971 to 73 that the two of them together were the tallest buildings in the world until they were surpassed by the Sears Tower, but they remain the largest buildings in the world in terms of the amount of floor <laughs> space that they created, right? Each floor was about an acre. Um, there were 110 floors, so, uh, and there were two towers, so 110 acres times two, 200 and close, but 220 acres of space, of office space. And um, uh, a whole city central business district on their own if you were looking at somewhere, some other metropolis um, in, uh, in New York. Um, certainly the sparse of past, but uh, you know, around the world. And even today, they remain the largest buildings in terms of the square footage of space, 4.6 million square feet in each one of the towers. And that has not been exceeded, even though some towers are um, another 50% taller than they were, Shanghai Tower, um, the Burj, uh, Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Um, which is much smaller, only 3 million square feet. So I don't mean to bore you with a lot of numbers, but, but it's, um, it's hard to recapture, I think, when you think about the towers, the, the gigantism that they represented in their, in their moment, which was a great um, kind of surging moment of American um, power. Right? And so what they represented in their historical moment, and even in 2000, 2001, was, a, was a, a kind of powerful dominance. Uh, but you know, the, um, history, uh, um, history of happens, right? And so um, to look back at them seemed a very appropriate thing tonight through the photography of um, Camilo Vergara and Richard Barinholtz, who for at least 30 years um, were recording towers from different places around the city, as you'll, Camilo will, will start. Um, and then Richard, as a, as a commercial photographer, I'm going to hold their, their t um, books up, actually, it's two versions of Richard's book, the big one, me, actually, medium size, because it's a bigger one than this, and then the small, the handy version of New York, and you can see previewed here um, very easily the, um, the, uh, the kind of vitality and romance of, uh, of the New York skyline that is, is Richard's um, kind of, uh, you know, singular uh, aesthetic. 
And Camilo is somebody who returns to place over and over again. Um, the documentation both of his life, um, of the um, subject of the skyline with, I asked him to look just at the Twin Towers tonight, um, but all of the surrounding urban context as well, because Camille is an urbanist and his work has really been directed at recording cities, in, especially in their decline, but then and also in their rise again. Um, so uh, Camilo's books you'll see on the um, table around the corner, he recently spoke um, here about um, Detroit is uh, No Dry Bones, uh, which documents his revisiting of, uh, of Detroit. He has another book on Harlem. So his approach uh, is uh, more, I suppose you'd say, sociological um, than uh, Richard's is, because Richard is, you know, frankly, a commercial photographer as well as an art, art photographer. So, the, so their approaches are very different, but the skyline is, I, I would say, their principal subject, the skyline in the city. So, um, so I, I look forward to a combination of being able to reminisce tonight and just you know, simply enjoy the beauty of their photographs, but to document um, two people who have really taken the skyline, subject of our exhibition, um, I'm here for uh, you know, another six months, and I hope you'll come back and look at it closely, who've taken the, the, the skyline of New York as their particular subject and now um, will, are willing to share their thoughts as well as their photographs with us. So, Camila.